Um, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. I am a, a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, and my area of interest is in craniofacial surgery. Um, the um, remit that I've been asked to discuss today relates to the craniofacial findings, and the disclosure that I would have, and this is something I've done fairly extensively in consulting with a number of colleagues, is that most of us don't have a lot of experience in managing LDS uh, from a craniofacial point of view. And I'll probably explain why in a few minutes. Um, you all know this information, um, but what's relevant uh, about this uh, is that um, it's thanks to people like Dr. Bowden that's made my life a, a lot easier. You know, we see children from all different parts of the world who come in and present with unusual facial features. And it's very difficult just looking at these facial features to understand exactly what's going on. And the world of molecular genetics has really revolutionized our approach to craniofacial surgery and, and been a real, real uh, help. And you know that of the four subtypes, it's really the LDS1, which tends to have most of the craniofacial uh, concerns, maybe a little less of LDS2. And this is uh, Neva. She's taken from Sick Kids Foundation website. And when I saw this picture, my first thought was, she is a gorgeous, very happy-looking young lady. And, uh, and this is uh, sort of an illustration as perhaps why, in the world of craniofacial surgery, our involvement with LDS uh, is not quite so profound as those in the cardiovascular ar ar arena. The manifestations uh, really include a number of things. Small cheekbones, there's a slight downward slant to the eyes, hypertelorism or widening of the orbits, condition of craniosynostosis, which I'll get into, cleft palate, and then there are other issues that Dr. Cohen alluded to. And it's really only these three issues that we have to pay specific attention to from a functional point of view. We're all born with sutures. The sutures of the skull, which are the join lines between the different bones of the skull, are really important to allow the molding of the head during delivery. They're also very important to allow for growth of the head. And this is a head that has all of the sutures intact. When a suture is fused or is absent, which occurs in between 12 to 19% of LDS patients, what happens is that suture, which normally allows for the growth of the head at right angles to that suture, if that suture is fused, you get a restriction of growth of the skull, and you get compensatory growth. So here's a skull where the sutures are all open, and here's a skull where this suture is partially fused, so you can see that the skull is very abnormal in terms of its shape. The concern is that if this is a brain that's growing very rapidly in the first few months of life, could there be a constraint as a result of this? And this is something that we worry about. And we recognize certain patterns of growth. And we know that, for example, if a suture here is fused, the head's going to look like this. If both sutures are fused, it's going to look like this. If the central uh, suture is fused, it's going to look like a triangle, and so on. And the common form of craniosynostosis we see with LDS is sagittal synostosis. And the term sagittal synostosis is also called scaphocephaly, which comes from the shape of a keel of a boat. And this is a child with sagittal synostosis. These are the features, very long, narrow head, very narrow from side to side. The forehead is very prominent, and the back of the head can also be prominent. And this is a 3D camera view of two patients of mine. They're identical twins, and you can see the green outline here, which is a child who has sagittal synostosis compared to her twin sister, who doesn't. And this just illustrates the impact in terms of the change in head shape as a result of this suture being fused. Well, why do we worry about it? Intracranial pressure is an issue that can occur in between 5 to 15 percent of children with single suture synostosis. And this is a CT scan taken from a child with sagittal synostosis and LDS who has a Chiari malformation. The, the posterior portion of the hindbrain is under some pressure, and it's being pushed down into the spinal cord. And this may be a potential problem. And there are some LDS patients which may have ventricular megaly or hydrocephalus or extra fluid in the brain, and this can be compounded by sagittal synostosis. However, the majority of patients that I see, it's mainly related to the way that they look, cranial dysmorphism, and this can cause psychosocial concerns. And we know that in the cleft <coughs> lip and palate literature, having a facial difference can have all sorts of impact in terms of psychosocial well-being. Children can be socially withdrawn. They may have problems in terms of solving ability, decision-making. There may be cognitive issues. And they may not just fit in. And this is what drives me and the majority of the patients that I operate on to do surgery. I'd like to show this slide, which illustrates the team approach to craniofacial surgery. And whenever I show it, invariably people think I'm Lewis Hamilton sitting behind the steering wheel. I wish, but I'm not. This is the patient. I'm one of the many people around that car trying to make sure that whoever the patient is gets to where they need to go safely. 
And you can see that we have a very, very big team of people. And this is crucial to the success of craniofacial surgery in my arena. When we do surgery, it depends on the age of the patient. If we can capture these patients young, under six months of age, we can do an operation which involves removing the suture that's fused, and here's a CT scan afterwards, making some cuts in the bone and allowing the brain to actually form the shape of the head in a more natural fashion, and we help guide that with a molding helmet. It's a very, very effective way of operating on our children. For children over six months of age, the brain growth is slowed down, the bone's too thick, and it doesn't allow us to do that remodeling physiologically, so we literally have to take the skull, disassemble it, and then reassemble it. And as you can imagine, this is a very big operation. And these are those twins that I showed you, and here they are before surgery, and here the two twins are after surgery, demonstrating the impact of that surgery, and they're also, they're virtually identical, which is very, very uh, good to see. This is an example of a child over a 10-year period with sagittal synostosis before and then after surgery. And I have this saying in my clinic in terms of passing the supermarket test. If you walk past him in a supermarket, would you be drawn to any form of craniofacial dysmorphism? And I would hope not, and this is really the goal of treatment. Having said that, the number of patients that I've seen with LDS is fairly low, less than five. The number of patients that I've actually operated on for cranial synostosis with LDS is zero. And I think that's perhaps a good thing, because as I said, the craniofacial dysmorphism that we see with this uh, condition may not be that severe. Hypertelorism is something else that we notice in children with LDS, and this is essentially an increased distance between the eyes. And you can see it quite nicely on the CT scan here. This is also associated with a small jaw. And actually, having a slightly increased distance between the eyes is considered to be an attractive trait. And just so that you don't think I'm being sexist, these are some examples of very attractive Hollywood icons who, if you measure them out, have a slight degree of hypertelorism. It can be of varying degrees. It can be mild, moderate, or severe. And surgical reconstruction for this is, is quite a large undertaking. In my hands, it requires very careful preoperative planning with CT scans. We have the opportunity at this hospital to actually take the CT scan and make a three-dimensional model. So literally, I can do the surgery on the model, practice the surgery, and then make sure that all of the, the kinks and, 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 and uh, wrinkles are sorted out before we actually do the, the surgery on the patient. And, and this involves a lot of planning. And essentially, this is one of many techniques, literally cutting around the eye sockets, removing some bone in the middle, and then moving the eye sockets together. And by, in general, this is an operation we only really do for severe hypertelorism and in children over the age of seven so that we don't cut through the teeth which may be embedded in the upper maxilla. Here's a young girl who has hypertelorism, not an LDS patient. Here's her CT scan. Here's the surgical plan. And then here she is after she's had her surgery. And again, I would hope that she's now got to that point of being able to walk in a, an outdoor environment and not draw attention to her facial dysmorphism. And then the final feature that we need to think about is the cleft of the palate. You saw some pictures earlier. This is a bifid uvula, and this indicates that there may be a submucous cleft. Now, the palate is most important for the purposes of speaking. And if I was to stand here and have a lot of air escape through my nose, <laughs> but because my palate's intact, you can understand what I say. And this has huge social implications for people. If you meet somebody who has hypernasal speech, Many people automatically denigrate their level of intelligence because of the way they communicate. So with a person like this, who's obviously an adult who has a submucous cleft palate, he's probably got to where he is in life and not had speech issues. But when we see cases like this where there's an overt cleft palate, this is something that will require some surgical attention. And we know that with a submucous cleft palate, 50% of people will have normal speech. I can't give you what the statistics are like in LDS because we haven't got good information in that, and maybe Dr. Dietz has some. But we do know that very often, having a submucous cleft palate comes to attention after somebody's removed their tonsils. Because you remove the tonsils, and all of a sudden, you affect the mechanism of the palate to close and create that airtight seal, and then they start to develop speech problems afterwards. Obviously, because LDS involves a number of areas of mutations involving uh, the TGF beta family, there may be issues uh, with wound healing. In my experience with Marfan's and Ehlers Danlos syndrome is that the scars in, in patients we've operated on can be very wide and, and, and somewhat unstable. I don't have experience with LDS, but this is a theoretical concern. So, in summary, I would say that the craniofacial dysmorphism that is a common feature of LDS doesn't often warrant surgical intervention, but it does warrant some level of investigation. And a child who has a long, narrow head who potentially has craniosynostosis should be investigated for increased pressure. And that's something fairly simple that can be done. 
neurosurgery, plastic surgery, ophthalmology, and occasionally a CT scan. Surgical intervention is certainly possible, but it's not common, and as I mentioned, there's a potential for scar anomalies. I'm going to end with a quote, because LVS is a very small uh, uh, area, and this is one of the reasons that I, I, when I went into craniofacial surgery, I thought, this is great, I can get my head around this. But Keith Grint said, as long as you, are, as you are in ignorance of a subject, you can be certain about it. As soon as you become knowledgeable, you require humility and uncertainty, because you are now aware of how much there is to know, and probably that it's so much that you will never get there. So it strikes me that there's probably an element of that that's true today. But thank you for the opportunity of speaking.